hey, we're back. We're in the room. Here's what I want you to do. Look at the person next to you. Look right at them. Look right at them in their eyes. Say, hey, guess what? Now look at the other person, the first person you neglected. Look at them right in their eyes. Say, hey, we're back. We're back. Let's go. Man, I'm super excited to be back in the room. I know school has started. Who's excited about school starting? There's like, like three and a half, kind of. Okay. I'm with you. I, I don't know if I'm with that, but I know what I am with, and I'm excited to be back in the room tonight. We are starting a series called What's Wrong With Me? You ever ask yourself that question before? <laughs> Someone said literally every day. Sometimes I find myself in that same boat too. You ever ask yourself that? Like you find yourself doing something and you literally ask yourself the question, why am I doing this? Maybe there's something in your life and you know it's not good for you and you tell yourself that. You tell yourself, I know this isn't good for me, but I'm going to do this anyway. You ever found yourself there? I know I have before. And, and maybe you find yourself there right now. And I love how we call this, what is wrong with me? Overcoming habits that are stealing your joy. And that's what we're going to look at over the next few weeks in this series. And the Bible speaks to this idea, that question of why am I doing this? What's wrong with me? I don't want to do this. Romans 7 says this, starting in verse 15, Paul says this. I don't really understand myself. You ever felt that? I have. He says, for I want to do what is right, but I don't. Instead, I do what I hate. Verse 18 says this. And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. Verse 19. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. And I think so often we find ourselves in this spot. We find ourselves wanting to pursue good things. We find ourselves, maybe if, if you have a relationship with Jesus, you find yourself in this hard spot of wanting to follow after him, but, but you just can't seem to do it. You don't understand yourself. You do what you hate. I feel like we all struggle with that at one point in our life. And, and if I can just be real, I've struggled with that too. There's been things that I've thought in my head that I'm like, why am I thinking that? There's things that I've said out loud. There's things that I've said to people. There's things that I've done. There's places I've been. All of those things. And, and in, I can remember in those moments, I remember asking myself, why am I doing this? What is wrong with me? And maybe you find yourself in that exact same spot, spot tonight. But can I encourage you? There's a better way to live than just sitting in that. There's hope. You can overcome that. And that's what I want to look at tonight. And the topic that we're going to be talking about tonight is pride. The topic we're going to be talking about is pride. And if anyone can be honest, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. If you would say you kind of struggle with pride a little bit maybe. Okay. We got a few hands. And I want to talk to you tonight. <laughs> but I specifically want to talk to those of you who may have been too prideful to raise your hand to say that you struggle with pride. I used to think I didn't struggle with this. I thought pride was just people who thought they were better at everything than anyone else. That's all I thought that pride was. I remember, I think this started for me whenever I was in drumline. Anyone else in drumline? Shout out to Gavin. Where's Gavin? Yes, sir. Shout out drumline people. Let's go. I was in drumline, and I remember my senior year, one of the cadences we played, I had a solo in it. And I thought I was that dude. You know what I'm saying? I thought I was him. And I remember sometimes I'd be like, oh, dude, don't. I'll let you have my solo tonight. You can play it. Like if I felt bad for someone else that they didn't have a solo, that created a big amount of pride in me. I remember after I graduated high school for a season of time, I would make these like TikTok devotional videos. And at one point they started getting a lot of views and a lot of likes, and that's all I got consumed with. I started living for a like in all reality. I started living to see that view number go up, and I wasn't real, and, and I thought I was doing something amazing. And, and if I can be honest with you as well, even whenever I started working here, I was nervous. I wanted to, to be liked. I wanted to do good in speaking opportunities. And sometimes it, it was easy for me to, like, just think of, okay, what's the one line that's going to get them? And I would live for the applause from you and from other people. And I would just crave that. And as I'm up here tonight, I just want to say I'm sorry that that was my heart. 
that that was in my life. Like, I want to be able to be real with you guys. That was a thing that was crept up in my life and something that I'm going through. I don't have this down perfect. And I'm trying to live this out too. And I'm excited to show you what God has showed me in studying for this. So real quick, I want to run you through some questions. The book, Why Do I Do What I Don't Want to Do by Jonathan Pakluda gives questions about this topic of pride. So maybe you think you don't struggle with it. I'm going to ask you some questions. I just want you to answer them in your head. Here's a list of like 12 or so questions. You ready? Here we go. Are you anxious? Are you critical of others? Are you defensive when someone points out sin in your life? Are you quick to notice pride in others? Do you constantly seek out the approval of others? Are you critical of others? Are you insecure? Do you take advantage of God's grace? Do you feel ashamed? Do you think your sin is bigger than God's grace can handle? Do you believe that you are worthless or unforgivable? And does a particular sin define you more than God's claim on your life? I want you to think about those questions. And whenever I was reading that, as I went through every question, you know what my answer was? Yes. I'm either struggling with that right now or I have at some point in my life. Like I would go to a question, are you anxious? Yeah. I'm anxious for the future right now. Have I been anxious before? Yes. Have I been critical of others before? Yes. Have I been defensive when someone points out sin in my life? Yes, I have. So I want you to understand that pride is it's a deeper thing than just thinking someone's better than, than everyone else. That's what this issue of pride is. And can I tell you, God does not like pride. In fact, God hates pride. Proverbs 8, 13 says this, all who fear the Lord will hate evil. Therefore, God says this, I hate pride and arrogance. It's right there. We see it super clear. God says, I hate pride and arrogance. And since we have that reality, there's something that we need to do about it if we're feeling pride creep up in our life. It's not a good place to stay there. So what do we do? What do we do? Now that we know God hates pride, I have a great answer for you. It's found in 1 Peter 5. Chapter, 1 Peter 5, verse 5 says this. And all of you dress yourselves in what? Humility. As you relate to one another. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So if God hates pride and we have that reality, how do we combat that? We clothe ourselves with humility. And I've heard it said this way. Only with humility can we really live the Christian life as it was intended. Only by clothing on humility are we able to step into the amazing purpose and plan that God has for each one of our life. And in that same book that Jonathan Bacluda writes that gave those questions, he says this for a great definition of what humility is. He says this. Biblical humility is not just thinking of yourself less, but also thinking of others more or thinking more of others. It's not just thinking of yourself less, because if you just think of yourself less, if you think about that question, maybe you have found yourself before thinking, I feel worthless. Maybe you've told yourself that before. Maybe someone else has told you that before, and you started believing it, and it's just a constant cycle of, I'm worthless, I'm nothing, I'm unforgivable. Having that mindset and sitting in that is prideful. You're keeping the focus on yourself instead of focusing on the truth that God, the creator of everything, uniquely created you. He calls you his masterpiece. That's what he calls you. I just love that definition. So tonight, we're going to see why pride is very dangerous in our life. If we let it sit there, that's the danger zone. That's not good. But we're also going to see how valuable it is to put on humility in our life and how you can live this out right now, how you can take a next step tonight. That's what we're going to look at, all right? And the first thing I want you to see is this, talking about pride first, is that pride produces hurt. Pride produces hurt. And in studying for this, I found something that really helped me a lot. And when I saw it, I couldn't wait to share it with you. I'm serious. Because I think it's very eye-opening and very helpful. It's called the pride cycle. Do you mind putting that up on the screens for me? This is what I call the pride cycle. And I found this, and I think it's super helpful. Here's where it starts. It starts with pride at the top. And when we let pride sit in our life, that leads to sin. 
What is sin? It's a term that means to miss the mark. It's things that separate us from God. And, and that sin from pride will lead to shame, will lead to embarrassment, will lead to hurt. And since we're feeling that embarrassment and that shame and that hurt, that leads to us in a prideful way trying to cover it up. Which in its own way is prideful, which leads to more sin. Have you ever felt yourself in that cycle before? I felt myself there too. And if we're not careful, we can just sit in this cycle. And Satan would love nothing more than to keep you in that cycle because pride produces hurt. Proverbs 16, 18 says this, pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. It literally says pride comes before destruction. I don't think anybody wants to sit in a place that, has, that involves destruction and hurt and things falling apart and things tearing apart. And Satan would love nothing more than to keep you in that spot. He would love nothing more than to keep you in that anxious spot. He would love nothing more than to keep you in that insecurity that you feel. He would love nothing more than to keep you in that critical spirit of others. He would love nothing more than to keep you in the mindset of, man, my sin is too, too big for God. I don't, I don't, I don't think he, he wants to deal with that. He wants to keep you in that prideful thinking. But I want to encourage you a way to combat that. Think about this for a second. Any people love cats in the room? Oh, <laughs> there we go. Someone really does back there. Okay. Your boy, not so much, but that's fine. Love them in the Lord, that's great. Here's the deal. I want you to think of a stray cat. Just picture a stray cat for me. Maybe you've seen one on the road. Maybe you've seen one in your neighborhood, whatever. What happens if you continuously feed that stray cat? It finds a home. It knows, okay, this person's going to give me food. I got a place to stay. I got a place to say, and we have that same choice when it comes to Satan in our life. In this area of temptation, when he tries to tempt you with those prideful thoughts or actions, we have a choice to either let him eat or to starve him. And whenever we starve him, he becomes weak. How do we starve him? We combat those lies that he gives us with truth. And how do we find truth? In God's word. That's why those daily spiritual disciplines that we talk about are so important, I promise you. Getting in God's word every day is so important. Actually talking to him because he wants to talk to you too. And he wants you to talk to him. Getting to know him. Getting in rooms just like this multiple times a week is so important. That's why we're always so excited that you're here because this matters. Getting in community matters. All of those things will help you combat the lies with truth that will change your life whenever you starve him he becomes weak and when he's weak he knows he doesn't have a home and you're able to resist him through the power of God through his strength you can resist him so whenever we see pride we need to know pride produces hurt Proverbs 16 pride comes before destruction the next thing I want you to see is this pride is a product of control Pride is a product of control. And if you're like me, this is an area that I struggle. I struggle with control. I like to know what's next. I like to know what's happening. I like to know where I'm going. I like to cling to those things and be in control of those things. And, and I heard an illustration that I, I, I really liked and I, I wanted to share with you as well. Over here, what I have is this. Does anybody at home do their own laundry? Raise your hand. Oh, wow. Okay. A lot of you. That's good. If you don't, I would encourage you to start. It's great. It's great discipline. Here's what happens. And real quick, I promise these are clean. Okay. I promise you they're not dirty. I, I, I promise you. Here's what happens, though. Sometimes we don't have a bag like that. We don't have a laundry basket. So what do we do? I call this the laundry walk. Here's what happens. <laughs> See? I can't even... We, we try to hold everything, and I can't even hold all that, but we try to hold everything, don't we? And then, as and it, this is awkward, isn't it? This looks really weird. Here's what happens. We try to hold all this, and after a while, at first it's like, okay, kind of, but then we start walking, and we drop something, and in an effort to look back, we drop more stuff, and when we go to try to pick up something else, we drop everything, 
And whenever we have that walk, whenever we try to hold on to all that stuff, we try to carry everything. We think we're in control of the situation. But what we find out is this, is that we're carrying too much. We're holding on to too much. And eventually it's all going to crash. I've heard it said this way. Good things become bad things when we try and carry too many. Good things become bad things when we try and carry too many. So maybe you're in the room and you have this idea of pride like this. Like, I got this. Every area of my life, God, I'm going to go ahead and try real quick over here. Um, I hear that I'm, you know, supposed to give you, like, full control over my life. But I'm going to cling on to this for a little bit and try to carry this as well. And if that doesn't work, I'll hit you up. All right, I'll see you later. You ever had that mindset before? That I got this type of pride. I think it's interesting. We see this type of pride in Satan's beginning, in Satan's origin story. I would encourage you, go read it for yourself in Ezekiel 28. I'll give you the summary. Basically, Satan decides that being in relation to God, being in a relationship with him is not enough. And he tries to be God himself. And I think so often we can try and do this too. I want to encourage you. Matthew 10, 39 says this. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. In other words, Jesus is saying this. If you try to control every aspect of your life, if you try to cling to that feeling you're chasing after, if you try to just cling to that satisfaction of anything else but Jesus, if you try to cling on to those anxious thoughts, if you cling on to those insecure thoughts, if you cling on to that critical spirit of other people, if you cling on to that prideful spirit, if you cling on to that unforgivable spirit, you will lose your life. But if you give your life up for me, Jesus says, if you give full surrender, man, that's where life is at. And he's saying right now, I got a beautiful purpose and plan for you. It's time to let go. It's time to give me control. So maybe you think everything depends on you in the room. Maybe just like that, you're trying to carry way too much. You got that idea of the, I got this pride. But what if tonight you were like, God, I'm going to give you everything. What if you, you got rid of that, that pride and said, Jesus, I give you full surrender. I'm going to tell you it's so worth it. I know it's scary. I know it's easier said than done, but I'm telling you, it's so worth it. So we looked at pride. We looked at pride produces hurt in our life. Proverbs 16, pride comes before destruction. And we also saw that pride is a product of control, trying to cling to everything, trying to carry way too much. Now let's look at humility and why it's so worth it to clothe ourselves in humility. It's worth it because humility produces hope. Let's read 1 Peter 5 again. It says this, in all of you, dress yourself in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Verse 6, so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. For he cares for you. I think those verses, they, those verses encourage me so much. And, and one of the things I get from that is that we need to dress ourselves in humility because humility looks good on everybody. You know what I'm saying? Humility looks good on everybody. I remember a few months ago, actually, I uh, was going to my sister's graduation party. She was graduating high school, and I kind of wanted to get a little dressed up a little bit. You know, I want to look, look good, want to look vibey. And I had just got these new shorts, and I loved them. And I was like, these are so sick. I'm going to wear these to the party. So I put my polo on. I put my, put my shorts on, and they were like these, like they were like athletic shorts. I don't even know really what I was going for. I was just going for something. And I was like, I look amazing right now. I walk out in the living room. I'm like, yo, mom, <laughs> what'd you think of the fit? I'm ready for this party. Let's go. And my mom literally does this. She goes, ooh. Um, and then she says, you got anything else? <laughs> and I was like, there's no way my mom just said that to me. Like, there's no way. But I had this pride in my heart and in my mind, even in that moment, of I look amazing. I'm that dude. 
but I was clothing myself in the wrong thing for my sister's graduation party. And I think a lot of us clothe ourselves in pride. And in the reality of us doing that, it's like we're wearing a weighted vest. You ever work out with a weighted vest before? What that does is that makes the workout harder than it needs to be. It adds a little bit of something to the workout. And as you're working out, you may look a little stronger because you got the vest on. You may look a little bit bigger. You may get a better pump, right? You may get a better photo for the gram. I don't know. It may look better, but in reality, you're making it so much harder than it needs to be. And clothing ourselves in humility, that produces hope. Not just for us, but for other people around us. Why? Why does it produce hope for us? Because whenever we clothe ourselves in humility, God shows grace to us. God turns toward us. Verse 6 talks about how he, he will guide us and lift us up at the right time. And lift us up, not so we look good, but so we can point other people to the one that gives us hope. And this gives us hope because we're able to give him everything because he cares for us. And, and, and that phrasing, it says, give all your worries and cares to God. Other translations say, cast all your anxieties onto him. And that word, it's like a fishing term, cast. It's not just like this, I'm going to toss a little bit, let's see what happens. It's like you're throwing everything. It's like, God, I'm giving you all my worry. I'm giving you everything I'm thinking about. I'm trying to control everything. I'm living in anxiety. I'm living with a critical spirit. I'm living in pride right now. God, I give you everything. And we're able to do that. And we can have hope in that because he cares for us. And he cares for you more than you could ever imagine. I want you to know that. I also want you to believe that in your heart, too. That humility produces hope. Last thing, and then, then we'll be done, is this, about humility. Is that humility is a product of surrender. Humility is a product of surrender. It kind of combats that idea that product, pride is a product of control. And a, a few months ago, I, I saw this illustration on the topic of surrender. Um, author John Tyson writes a book called The Burden is Light. And one of the chapters in the book is, an, is, is a chapter about control and surrender, this exact topic. And what he finds out is this. Has anyone ever heard of a trapeze before or a trapeze artist, right? Okay. I think I have a video of that. Can I show this video real quick just so you can get a better idea? Here we go. You see that guy right there, and you see the bar. You see him swinging. <laughs> I don't know if I could do that. I'd probably pee myself. I'm not going to lie. Here we go. Boom. And the other person that catches him. So you see the three parts right there. Who thinks that they could do that? Raise your hand. <laughs> we, we got one. We got a few. There it is. I would not want to do that. Here's the deal. This author looked at that and was like, this is a great idea for surrender. Because here's the thing. The person letting go of the bar has to let go of surrender. They have to let go of control, excuse me. And they have to surrender everything in order to be caught safely. And in the book, John Tyson talks about how he was preaching a message one time and used this idea of surrender. And these two people came up to him afterwards and were like, hey, we love that idea of surrender um, and, and the idea of using a trapeze. We're actually in trapeze school, um, and, and we think you're missing a critical part of this, and we would love to show you. And John was like, okay, sweet, let's do this. I'm in. So him and his wife go, and they're, like, face-to-face -face with this. Like, they're, like, up close to trapeze artists and trapeze students learning this thing. And what these students said is this, is that most people just think of the catcher, the bar, and the person letting go. That's what most people think of. And the students told him this. But they miss the crucial thing that gives you the confidence to let go in the middle of the air. On the ground is a trapeze instructor. An expert who understands every element in the trapeze world. And they know just where you are in the movement. They know just where you are. And they begin to say that whenever the expert, the expert instructor on the ground will yell out to you whenever it's time to go. They'll give you the signal. They're going to yell to where you can hear it. They're going to call out to you whenever it's time to go. And whenever you hear their call, you're able to trust that they can see what you can't. That's what these students said. You're able to place trust in this person and not your own sense of skill or timing. And that's what enables you to let go. So John Tyson, this guy that wrote this book, he tries this. First time, 
He tries to listen to the voice, then he gets scared and he lets go. Wrong timing. And he wasn't caught as safely as he could be. And he gets up there again. He's like, okay, I'm going to try again. Gets on the bar, swings out, lets go, didn't listen to the master's voice, and then he wasn't caught as safely as he could have been. Third try, he says this. By the third attempt, I consciously tried to relax and listen for the master's voice. His position on the ground and seeing the whole situation and my exact position in the air gave me hope. He says this, I took a hold of the bar and swung out into the air. My body was tense, my ears straining for the voice I now knew I could trust. And there, in a confident, clear tone, that yell rang out. Without fear and hesitation, I loosened my grip and let go. And he was caught safely because he listened to the master's voice. And he writes this sentence after this illustration that I love. He relates this to us giving surrender to God. He says, when we trust God, we are not surrendering to chaotic forces or blind chance. We are surrendering to love. And maybe you're in a spot where you want to give God surrender, but you don't know, and you want to you wanna let go of clinging to everything and controlling everything, but you don't know because you're like, ah, that, that seems kind of chaotic, and, and um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I can trust him. When you surrender to God, you surrender to love. How encouraging is that? How beautiful is that? And I believe that right now, God is calling some of you tonight to surrender. To those things that you're clinging on to, that you're clinging to your life. In a prideful sense, you might be clinging to that anxious feeling you're feeling. You might be clinging to that feeling that's telling you you're worthless and unforgivable and unlovable and you're terrible. Maybe tonight you're just holding a grudge against somebody and you won't forgive them. Maybe tonight you know that you wronged somebody and you don't want to ask for forgiveness. I don't know what that looks like in your life, but maybe you're trying to control everything. And I want to encourage you, when you surrender to God and give him complete control, you surrender to love. You surrender to the creator of the, uni of the universe who's committed to your flourishing. He's committed to your joy. And he has plans to give you hope in a future. And he has a greater plan than you can ever imagine. And I believe he's calling out to some of you right now and saying, let, let go. And he's saying let go because he's going to catch you safely. And he's right there for you. And the last thing I want to encourage you with is this, and then we're done. Is that Jesus is the ultimate example of humility. When we look to Jesus... When we're looking to start humility, like, like where do I look to start that? Look to the example of Jesus. Philippians 2 says this in verses 7 and 8. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Jesus, the son of God, left perfection, humbled himself to nothing, and came to earth. Lived a perfect life. Lived sinless life and died the most humiliating death possible on the cross for you i want you to picture it nails in his hands and nails in his feet crown of thorns on his head he was whipped he was spit on he was beaten he was mocked and he died for you and died for your sin and why did he do that because like i talked about earlier the idea of sin it's this idea to miss the mark and us we are sinful and broken and disgusting people. And God is holy and perfect and right and pure. And those two things can't coexist. But God just didn't look at us in our state and said, ooh, that stinks. Hopefully they figure that out. He didn't say that. He loved you more than you could ever imagine. And he wanted to bridge that gap with you. And that's why he sent Jesus, the son of God. The king of kings, the perfect one, lived a sinless life to die in your place. Because that sin has a debt. And because of that sin, we deserve death and separation from God forever. And Jesus took our place. But he didn't just stay dead. God raised him from the dead. God raised him from it so that we could have life. And that anyone who puts their faith and trust in Jesus and his work will be saved. Romans talks about anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't matter what you've done. 
doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've said. It doesn't matter what you're doing now or what area of your life you're in now. Jesus has called to me. My forgiveness is for you. His freedom is for you. His love is for you. And he wants a relationship with you. Jesus is the ultimate example of humility. And he's calling to you right now. He said, don't come into your life in pride. Don't try to control your life because pride just produces hurt. And it's a product of control. And, and I don't want you stuck in that cycle. I want you to know me. I want you to know truth. And he's extending life to you. And it's a free gift. And a free gift is not yours until you take it. And he's calling you to take it right now. If you've never done that, he's calling you to do that. So as we close, I want everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes for me. And maybe you hear me tonight and you're saying, Isaac, I've been clinging to my life. I've been clinging to pride. I've been clinging to control. And there's just this, there's this habit of pride in my life. And it's just producing hurt. And I'm trying to find life and satisfaction and all these other things, but I'm ready to follow Jesus. And if you are in your seat, I, I want you to do this with me. I'm, I'm going to say a prayer. And it's not about these... It, it's not like this magic script that you pray. I don't even have to hear it. I want you to make this personal. If you want to accept Jesus right now, I want you to pray this with me. Say, God, I need you. I see my sin. I know I'm a sinner. God, I believe that you sent Jesus to die for me. Would you forgive me? Would you make me new? Jesus, I surrender my life to you. And if you prayed that prayer, please come talk to somebody because we want to celebrate with you like crazy. That's the best decision you could ever make in your entire life, is giving your life to Jesus and putting your faith and trust in him. And if you have questions about that, please come talk to us. But maybe you're in a spot where you do know Jesus. But as we talked about pride tonight, you realized it may have been in your life a little bit more than you thought. It may have been. And, and can I ask you, this is going to take some courage and boldness. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you find yourself struggling with pride a little bit, would you have the courage to raise your hand just so we can see it? Yeah, I see those hands. Thank you, you can put those hands down. Can I say, if you just put your hand up, I'm so proud of you. Your vulnerability strengthens me. But can I also challenge you with something? It's time to do something about it. There's leaders all over this room that are here for you, that love you and care for you more than you know. They lose sleep over you. They cry over you. They find joy in you. And they want to talk to you. So I want to encourage you after this, talk to somebody. Don't leave this night. Don't leave this moment without making a decision and taking a next step. Because God doesn't want you to live in that pride cycle. He wants you to live in hope, in freedom, in life that he's extending you right now. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time. God, thank you for the truth that's found in your word. And God, God, thank you for in those moments where we're prideful. God, thank you that you restore us to a place of humility. And God, I pray that you would do that tonight. And God, if anything I said, a single word, went against you, your word, your character, and your heart, God, would you have people forget it? And God, would you just help us remember the truth that's found in your word? And if anyone's struggling with pride tonight, I pray they take their next step in humility towards you. I pray that they would talk to somebody. I pray that they would seek out help and love and God, if there's people in here that need to know you, not just know about you, but that need to know you, I pray that they would do that tonight. God, thank you for how good you are. Thank you for Jesus and what he's done. God, I pray for these students. Give them strength. Bless them. God, thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.